Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer, and my guest this week is Gangaji. Yes. Welcome, Gangaji. Thank you. I don't know if you had a chance to look at my site, but the, the subtitle of it is Interviews with Ordinary Spiritually Awakened People. <laughs> And uh, from what I've been listening of, you know, your interviews and, and satsangs and all, I've even heard you refer to yourself that way. So, um, it's sometimes when, you know, people become well-known in spiritual circles, they begin to attract a lot of sort of adulation and people mm -hmm. kind of forget that they're really, you know, ordinary people when you get right down to it. And, you know, listening to you and Eli, um, I was very kind of charmed and refreshed by your sort of down-to-earthness and honesty and courage and some of the things you said and good humor and all that. I, I think it puts people very much at ease. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, you've just written a book. You've written a number of books and you've been teaching for a long time. This one's called Hidden Treasure. Um, uncovering the truth in your life story and I thought I'd tell, start by telling you a little quick hidden treasure story that mm -hmm. I, I just came across some um, here in Iowa over in Des Moines about six months ago somebody bought a lottery ticket <clears throat> and they won they won 16.5 mm -hmm. million dollars mm -hmm. but they never cashed it in mm -hmm. uh, and that person could very well be working in some dead-end job or having their house foreclosed or going through all sorts of difficulties they're a multimillionaire and they mm. don't even know it. There it is. <laughs> there it is, really. That's essentially my message, is that you have already won the lottery. <laughs> you just don't know where to look. Yeah. And, and I'm just here to, to point out where to look. Mm. And you've been pointing that out for a long time, um, over 20 years now. Um, one of the things I heard you say in, in listening to you recently is that when, you first, when Papaji first asked you to start teaching, you felt it was a little premature or something, you know, like he just kind of threw you out there, out of the, <laughs> yeah. threw you out of the nest and said, here, fly. Um, looking back now, do you still feel it was premature or was that just the initial sort of butterflies that you had when you had to start teaching? Well, it was such a shock. Mm. And I did have a concept of what that meant to teach. Mm -hmm. And I also knew I, I, I hadn't even read Ramana's books, really. I was aware of Ramana. And I didn't know what the teaching was. I knew what my experience was. And so when he said teach, it just brought forth a, a, an agenda. And I knew I couldn't meet that agenda with what I had. And, and as you probably know, he was fine with that. He said, good, then you'll just speak from your experience. And he, mm. he really assured me that the people who are drawn to what I have to say don't need to learn anything that they're really ready to, to just stop and recognize that, that they've learned enough and that they can now return to the source of their being. And, and so I trusted that. Mm -hmm. I, I knew, I mean, I had just had this initial experience with him and, and really when he told me to teach, I hadn't had this huge shift that came later. But I trusted that I, I could just meet with people and share my experience, and so I didn't have to elevate myself, as you were speaking earlier. I could meet them as regular people, and that's what he wanted. He wanted me to be able to speak in plain English and speak in the vernacular of our times and, and speak as a person who is of the times. And he was like that, too, even though since he was an Indian patriarch there was a an aura of glamour around him but he was you know he was also a human being with moods and opinions and all the rest yeah i mean i've known some pretty famous teachers um maharishi and uh you know amachi and so on and mm -hmm. when you when you sort of get in the inner circle just a little bit or get a peep into it yeah, I mean, Amma likes to watch uh, Indian soap operas, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and Marshi had all of his human foibles and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. Even Ramana, who's supposed to be a total saint, got cranky and angry with people yeah. at certain times. Read the newspaper you know? and, and yeah, to the, yeah that kind had of lots stuff. of clocks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we're all human beings. Yes. 
So I'm sorry, go ahead. You were about to say. No, I was just going to say, you know, what you were saying about people and the sort of adulation that can draw up, that that can attract. That's often a, a phase that we go through because I know when I met Papa G, mm -hmm. it was as if he was uh, parenting me in a way that my parents weren't equipped to and I did look up to him I mean I still do and yeah. I did revere him and I recognized that what he was offering was really precious and so that is present but it doesn't mean that I saw him as having to be infallible in some kind of idealistic way mm -hmm. I recognize that he could be a full human being and yet what he had offered me was so huge that that I was at his feet you know I don't allow people to be at my feet um, <laughs> we're in a different culture yeah but but I think the respect that comes from really receiving a true teaching or a true transmission is valid and, and important so that you don't trivialize it. You don't yeah. just assume it's like, oh, this is like reading Time magazine or something. Right. Because it, it is something that is extraordinary. I'm reminded of the Gita when you said that where Arjuna, where Krishna referred to Arjuna as my devotee and friend. Ah, oh, You know? And, uh, and then in a... And they were very much on a you know friendship basis, but then at a certain point, Krishna revealed his full form, you know what he really mm -hmm. was, and Arjuna couldn't handle it for very long. He said, "Take it away! I just want to see you yeah. as the ordinary guy that I'm used to." <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's right. I think that's what happens is that we we get it in flashes, and it is so vast, whether it's the form of the guru or the form of life itself, that it's so huge that it penetrates our construction of reality but because we are human beings and we have these minds we reconstruct reality at a safe distance mm. but once it's been penetrated we also know that at a deeper place so when you first started teaching and you hadn't really had your big thunderclap moment mm -hmm. um, were you just saying to people hey you know I haven't had a big major shift but Papa G asked me to teach and here I am and here's what I want to tell you I mean is that the way you kind of presented it well, I had had major experiences. I didn't know that I hadn't had the major shift. Uh -huh. uh, I, I was totally happy, and maybe that's what really was the ground that allowed the major shift. I wasn't looking for anything else. Uh, I, he had stopped my mind. Mm -hmm. I had recognized that all of my search was trying to reach this place that was here, mm -hmm. and I was in a bliss state. And perpetually, more or less. Well, a lot, yeah. anyway. And people could, certain people could feel it. And so, really, he, he had said to me earlier, you just share yourself, and, and if they ask a question, you answer it. And so I didn't come in saying, this is what you do. Uh, the, it started by someone saying, I'm feeling something. I'm feeling kind of burning. What's happening? And I said, well, let me tell you what happened to me. Mm -hmm. And it, it rolled from that. But I think that this is really important, the fact that I wasn't looking for anything. I, I felt fulfilled. I felt I'd met my teacher, and I felt he had pointed me to this ocean of fulfillment, and I was just overflowing. And in that, I wasn't seeking, and so my mind wasn't measuring how enlightened am I? How deep am I? <laughs> right. it, it was spacious, and, yeah. and, and the shift was natural then. Mm -hmm. So um, we'll backtrack a little bit, but mm -hmm. uh, I want to. I'm, I'm prompted. I'm tempted to ask you about that thunderclap moment that you mentioned mm -hmm. um, on one of your recordings. You were at Esalen, I believe, with Eli doing something, and all of a sudden, out of the blue, kaboom! Yeah, yeah, we were. We were sitting on a bed laughing mm -hmm. uh, and just reveling in our good fortune mm -hmm. at, at meeting Papa G and just speaking of the Dharma and, you know, one of those wonderful conversations, but really just overflowing in love and recognition of good fortune. And then there was just a, I couldn't, it, it was not in time, although in a sense it was less than an instant. And there was just, I didn't even know it was there, but there was a removal of self-doubt. Mm. There was something that just, I mean, to say it fell away even sort of puts it in time, like there was some progression. It was just pop. Mm. And 
all of a sudden, I really recognized without a doubt that it is impossible for me to be separate from anything, mm. anything that I'm aware of, anything mm. that I'm experiencing. And <laughs> it just was an incredible moment, and the reverberations of that moment are still present. Yeah. Usually, doubt has a um, a kind of a mental connotation. You know, well, I I doubt that whether there is a heaven or a reincarnation or whatever. You know, we we use that word to refer to our ideas. Um, and you know, of course, a lot of those things are hard to resolve. But in your case, um, you know, it's clear that that sudden removal of doubt it didn't take place through an intellectual process. You're not trying to work something out and, okay, I got it now, I'm no longer a doubt. And also it had a profound impact experientially. It, mm. wasn't, it wasn't just a change in your mind, but your whole ground of being or whatever, your whole experience shifted um, in conjunction with that. Would you mm. care, to, care to elaborate on that observation? <laughs> yes, I would say it was global for huh. me. Global, what do you uh, mean by that? I, I mean that it was... I, I, the mind, the thinking mind was without doubt, mm -hmm. but also in maybe subconscious fixated regions, phew, that was gone. Mm. Uh, a habit of seeing myself as less than or inadequate or deficient. Mm -hmm. phew, was, I mean, the only way I knew it was removed <laughs> was because there was, I was right side up. It's as if you spend your life you know, walking with your head in the sand. Mm -hmm. And you don't realize that because that's where you've always lived your right. life. And then all of a sudden I was right side up. up, up. Huh. And everything was in place. So I can't say that after that moment I never had emotional doubt or I never had a sense of inadequacy. But something had been penetrated to such a degree that if some old vasana arose, some old habit of mind arose, it didn't have the same power. There was no place that it was, it could stick to. Mm. So that's what I mean when I say it was global. It was like a, a sweep. And and even these words aren't adequate, you yeah. know. I mean, it's it's really it was. Um, I felt it was Papa G's transmission, and it <laughs> it just took a while for it to penetrate. It it, it happened in my. My meeting Papa G, it, it mm. couldn't have happened without that, and and I was already feeling fulfilled, as I said, in meeting him, and so my mind was at ease. I wasn't trying to figure anything out. I, I didn't feel a need to to know anything in that moment, and we were laughing. I think yeah. that was important. So there was already it was this conducive over. to it. Yes, huh. yes, it was. A, was there even a shift? You say it's global. Was there even a uh, any kind of market shift in your physiology? Was there like a, a sudden settling mm. or s increased smoothness or any any such thing in the physiology? Maybe in that moment, I I would say my physiology has been slower to shift. <laughs> I think I think the body is denser and my nervous system is. Is still the nervous system I came in with, but mm. you know when I reflect on the way I was then, or, or really prior to meeting Papa G, and the way I am now, yeah, I mean I, I'm much more at ease naturally, mm -hmm. and, and much more. Yeah, things have lined up, but it took the body longer. Mm. But I wasn't looking to the body as a reference point. I right. wasn't looking to my emotions as a rest reference point. So they, in time, just settled. Settle is a good word for it. You use the word transmission. Um, do you feel that, and we, perhaps we can even define that a bit more, but do you feel that transmission is sort of the most critical element in bringing about people's awakening uh, as opposed to the words the teacher says or any, any other such a thing? I, I th believe it is critical. I mean, words are important, but we can get words and teachings from any number of sources, and they may even be transmitting, but if we aren't receiving that transmission, we can have an intellectual understanding, and that can support us mm -hmm. because it can resonate with something deep. 
But when I use the word transmission, I'm speaking really more generally, although maybe in this incident I was speaking specifically, but yeah. we're always transmitting to each other. Everyone. You know, we are, yeah, we're limbic yeah. brain creatures. So mm. on this Skype, there's a transmission, you know, that either comes from our body language or, or maybe even more mysterious than that or, mm-hmm. or more subtle. But just as human beings, we we pick up each oh we can get it from a book or a photograph yeah so there's some mystery and and usually what we're picking up from each other is suffering or misery or if somebody's happy and laughing we pick that up possibly but with papaji his his transmission was congruent with his teaching with his words and so there was an alignment with that that made his words as powerful as the transmission, and yet he could be totally silent, and there was a transmission. Mm. But for me, the words were were very important because I, I was a mental creature, and um, I an mean, English, I am an English teacher at one point. <laughs> yeah, and, <laughs> and I like the workings of the mind, and um, and his words were so beautiful. He was uh, he really used the language very exquisitely. Yeah. I've had the opportunity to be in the presence of a couple of great teachers, as I mentioned, and, and in my experience, the, the, the darshan, you know, the feeling mm-hmm. in their proximity, you can cut it with a knife. I mean, it, uh-huh. there, there's just this sort of thick spirituality mm-hmm. or whatever you want to call it that just profoundly shifts you mm-hmm. if mm-hmm. you're in, the, in that, you know, atmosphere. I mean, that must have been your experience around Papaji. Well, he definitely had a lot of shakti. He had yeah, a lot yeah. of energy. Uh, yeah, yeah, you know, and I've also been in the presence of other teachers who had a lot of Shakti or people who weren't even teachers, just yeah. people who, who have charisma or Shakti. And um, But I think when you're with someone who is, as you're referring to, a spiritual teacher, a master, someone who has the Shakti, maybe naturally, or the charisma, we could call it, and they have the, the realization to go with that, then it's like arrows, you know, hitting home. Yeah. And you're also attuning yourself to them. I mean, you know, you could be thick as a brick and that might not have any influence, but you're you're receptive, you're open, you're you're focusing on what they're doing or you know, who they are or whatever. And so it's like there's this resonance that allows their transmission to and they you know, facilitate your awakening. You know, I paid very close attention to Papaji. Yeah. But he often spoke of different kinds of people, and he said that they are camphor people. They're people who receive the transmission or hear one word, and they just ignite. Mm-hmm. And then there are people that are like paper, you know, it takes putting the flame to them, and then they ignite. And there are people like wood, where you have to fan it a little bit, and maybe then like wet wood, where you have to fan <laughs> it a lot. And he said there are some rock people, there are stone people. But still, the heat will, the shakti, the energy, the transmission will finally penetrate. I think that's good for people to hear because mm-hmm. I think some people get discouraged sometimes. Yeah. You know, they feel like, oh, I'm one of the stone people. You know, <laughs> it's never going to yeah. happen to me. And uh, I've seen people actually who meditated mm-hmm. for decades, were on a spiritual path, and end up just giving up and going back to yeah. drugs or, or, you know, yeah. just or, mess- cynicism. or, or yeah. alcoholism. You know, a friend yeah. of mine died about a year ago, uh, you know, from drugs mm-hmm. and alcohol, whom I had been on long meditation courses with back in the 70s. And, that, you know, I, I, I don't know. It's, it's, it's good to keep the inspiration alive and to realize that it may be a lot closer than you think. Oh, it is so much closer than you think. <laughs> yeah. And, and this is the thing, and that's, that's part of how Sangha can be supportive. And also, we can recognize how we are we are educated to measure and to judge, and and mostly the way we've been brought up, if not by our families, by our, our system, is the judgment is harsh, and we set some kind of idealistic standard, mm. which really is not real. It too is just an idea, but I've seen people so attached to an idealistic standard that they're simply overlooking their their own overflowingness it's already happened even even as a rock person that they're they're already molten and other people can see it yeah. but they are they're still attuned to where they're not that mm. rather than they are 
Beautiful. No, I really think that's important. In fact, that was one of my motivations for starting this show. I, I started it initially with the intention of just interviewing people here in Fairfield because I was encountering mm -hmm. a lot of people that I thought were having genuine spiritual awakenings, but then I was encountering others that say, oh, it's not happening to anyone, and anyone who says it is is on some kind of an ego mm -hmm. trip, and you know, you have to be able to mm -hmm. levitate if you're enlightened, and so, and so on. So I thought, all right, let's have a show, and let get, get some of our friends and neighbors out there and have them tell their stories, and that's how this whole thing started. And, you know, and mm -hmm. I've had any number of people say to me, wow, I never realized that people were actually waking up. Mm -hmm. and I'm so, you know, they, you know, it's been so inspiring for them. Oh, I'm so glad. <laughs> I'm so glad. That's real Sangha then. Yeah. You know, I, I love the Buddhists with the, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, and they're all equal. Mm -hmm. So there's the awakened mind, there's the truth that's revealed, and there's the Sangha. And, and they, it's like Satchitananda or something. They all go together. So, Maybe you could define Sangha in case somebody's not familiar with that word. Well, community. Right. Uh, community like-minded people and and those who are supporting you mm -hmm. on the on the path of your awakening path of your realization yeah. this meeting yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. now you said a while back that um, Papaji stopped your mind and I've heard you say a number of times um, in almost every talk that at a certain mm -hmm. point he, he said to you just stop mm -hmm. and um, as I listened to you over the l last week or so I, my understanding of what he meant by that kind of evolved as I heard mm -hmm. you explain it in different ways so maybe you could explain it for the sake of those listening, what he said and what you understood it to mean and, mm -hmm. and the effect it had on you and so on. Well, my understanding continues to evolve <laughs> with that. Uh, when he said that, because I said, so how? How do I get freedom? And I really was expecting him to give me some teaching or some mantra or some special practices. I, I, I didn't know what he said to people. And he said, stop. And at first, I took that in pretty superficially. I, I thought he meant like a Vipassana retreat or something, just don't move. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and then it was clear it was, it was something deeper than that. And finally, that very word, just stop, turned my attention to the activity of my mind. Mm. And I saw, I recognized, and more deeply over time, that, that my mind, my thinking mind, that, that is, was going it was like, which like is the nature of the thinking like a mind. mouse on a wheel just kind of going yeah, going, yeah it was trying to grasp something mm -hmm. or trying to keep something away or mm -hmm. fighting something mm -hmm. <laughs> those are the three basic movements and when i finally was able to let that stop in i mean this isn't happening all the time for any of us I, there are periods where there's just spaciousness but because we are conditioned to the grasping or the f fighting or the hiding or escaping, we overlook these periods, moments in a day of just spacious openness. And really what this stop was turning me to was, was the spaciousness that's always here. Mm. And so <clears throat> when I allowed it in, I, I recognized that all of my grasping or my attempts to grasp and all of my fighting or attempts to fight or hiding and withdrawing was all a search. Uh, and finally, when I, I distilled that even more, it was really a search for who am I? I, I believe that we are born searching for this and we, and we take on identities based on our parents or based on our culture or genetics, whatever. And so this was an invitation to stop trying to grasp an identity and stop trying to fight an identity or hide from an identity. And so my mind could open and I could recognize what's always been here, that all of this activity of searching, <laughs> I mean, it really is funny, all of this searching was, was trying to get what's already here. <laughs> And maybe we have to do this search to, to make the circle. I mean, we do. That's part of our, our individuation and then our recognition of the limitation of individuation. But in an instant, my, when I say my mind stopped, the activity of, of searching stopped. And so when I say my mind stopped, I'm really speaking of my thinking mind. My thoughts stopped. 
but consciousness was fully here <laughs> and it was and that was the beginning because from that I could recognize that a thought could appear and consciousness is still fully here it's consciousness is never absent so whether did, there did are your, thoughts no I'm sorry go ahead no no I was finished oh, okay did your thoughts stop right then and there when uh, Papaji said that or are you saying over a period of what days or weeks or something it, it sort of the momentum settled down well, actually, Eli had come to see me when I was in California after he had initially been with Papa G. Mm -hmm. And when I met with him, he had this transmission of the silent mind. His he, mind. He had already imbibed it and yes, kind of transmitted already, it to you. Absolutely. He I had see. received it from Papa G and he was transmitting it. Ah. And so I was already struck with that. But Eli was my husband and so, <laughs> you know, we were already on this relationship where he was not my teacher. Right. And there was a way I sabotaged that or, or trivialized it or mm. diminished it. And so, but I had the initial experience from Eli. And then when I went to Papa G, it was there it was. Yeah. And I was able to surrender to it. Hmm. That's great. Um, and of course, I mean, just to clarify, you're not saying that your mind never thought thoughts anymore after that. That's, that's not the, what you mean no. by stop, because I mean, you wouldn't be able to function if you, you couldn't think thoughts. You're just, you're just saying the overshadowing nature of thought, you know, thought to the exclusion of consciousness was no longer the situation. Or, or did I get that wrong? I'd say, it's, yes, partially right. That's true. Uh -huh. But there was a moment where there was no thought. And, yeah, a moment. And, they, and there was a recognition that actually functioning doesn't, Often functioning doesn't need thought. Right. And often we don't think in simple functioning. I mean, the example I love to give is if you're kissing somebody, if you're thinking, you're not really kissing. <laughs> <laughs> and, and when you are really kissing, you don't need to think. <laughs> and that's true. That's uh. true with life. You know, if you're embracing and being embraced by life, you don't need to think. And thought <laughs> clearly has a place. But in our Western culture, we have given thought primacy, and and as a result, we are trying to think our way to enlightenment, or think our way to peace, and mm. think our way to freedom, and and with that, we we are just accumulating more knowledge and and fighting ideas of ourselves that conflict with that knowledge. And so, really, Papa G was inviting me and transmitting this possibility to to throw away the measuring stick, to throw away the, the knowledge and recognize who you are. <laughs> the reason I laughed so much when you gave that kissing example is that a far side cartoon popped into my mind of these, these two insects. Uh, uh, we're out on a date and it's time to say goodnight and he's standing there at her doorstep and he says, well, I guess I should kiss her goodnight, but where are her lips? Are I, wonder, <laughs> I wonder if those do hickeys are her lips. <laughs> <laughs> thinking about yeah, it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just just close your eyes and allow the kiss. <laughs> uh, so another thing I heard you say about this stop um, instruction was that, and maybe this wasn't the whole the whole of it, but I heard you refer to it as being a a, a relinquishment of sort of the the tendency to put everything in conceptual cubby holes, um, oh, yeah. you, know, you, you know what I mean, that um, to sort of somehow let go of one's tendency to um, be gripped by one's opinions and to define everything according to one's opinions, but to be in, in a more of a, a not knowing state. Yes. Uh, yeah. Well, the the initial experience with Papa G and, and experiencing my mind stopping and mm -hmm. realizing in that the fulfillment and the joy that I was trying to get through thinking was already here, then I could more easily, and this is part of the vigilance, more easily be aware when thinking did reoccur, or either functional thinking or thinking that was perhaps triggered by some emotion or something. It was obvious. It had weight, it had noise, and so I could take responsibility for my thoughts. And clearly some thoughts are no problem at all. And some thoughts are these habitual replays. And so 
and that's what I mean. There are categories that we have formulated about who we are, who other is, and and we know this in terms of cultural or or religious or, of course, we know the extremes of this too, or war. Yeah. And um, and so it, it's really, you mentioned earlier, this doesn't mean <clears throat> no thought. What it really, the opportunity is, is in recognizing no need for thought, mm -hmm. then there is the uh, capacity, greater capacity, to take responsibility for what is thought and to recognize that it is is not the whole of it and it's a, a point of view it's a version of reality and there may be some legitimacy to it but it's not reality so when you say no needs for thought uh, do, am i correct in understanding you to mean that no need for thought where thought is where it's really not thought's role to be involved Mm -hmm. In other words, trying to grasp something that can't be grasped by thought. I mean, you need thought to book an airline flight, but you don't need it yeah. to, you know, do to to realize the self or to, um, yes, you know. You don't need it. In fact, it's in the way about who you are. Right. And most of us have learned to think who we are. We have images. We have the cubby holds. We have characterizations, and we have multiple. Uh, versions, some versions we like, some we don't like, but they're all composed of thought, and they're insubstantial and unreal. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. this kind of segues nicely into the theme of your book, um, your, your most recent book, which is Uncovering the Truth in Your Life Story. And uh, I thought that was kind of mm -hmm. bold of you. I mean, it's <laughs> not, because there, I mean, you are who you are, and you teach the way you <laughs> teach, but there are a lot of teachers these days t to whom the, the, the word story is kind of a dirty word, you know. Oh, that's just your story, and uh, you know. And, and why would you want to talk about that? Because there's really no person, and therefore you're only reinforcing the notion of a person by talking about your story and so on. And even in terms of your teaching, I heard you used to throw a beanbag at people that were too caught up in their stories or something. And yet here in this book, you're um, suggesting that one can f use one's story as a uh, as a doorway into the, the truth. Well, I, I really feel like I've contributed to this uh, spiritual view that the story is the obstacle, and so this is a, a oh, correction to that. So, now, <laughs> yeah, yeah, because and I do still throw bean bags if someone is over <laughs> involved in a story. But uh -huh. anytime we make something as some obstacle, whether it's our story or our vasana or our, our physiology, our biochemistry, our nervous system. It, there's this separation, and, and we have to somehow overcome this obstacle. And that in itself, of course, is a story. And this book is really uh, as support to, first of all, recognize perhaps what story you are telling yourself about your story, mm -hmm. so that you can see that, that as human beings, just as you were saying, thought has a function, <clears throat> certainly storytelling has a function, <clears throat> Excuse me, we are. <clears throat> let me just take a swallow. Sure, yeah. <clears throat> we are storytellers, and it's beautiful. And <clears throat> I benefit from stories of all kinds. I'm always reading stories, but the stories that are dysfunctional are the ones we tell about who we are. And the most dysfunctional ones are the ones we don't know we're telling about who we are. Mm. And so this book is really uh, designed to support the reader in more deeply discovering the story and how we are being victimized by the story or why, or how we just think it's not the story, it's reality. Yeah. And so, yeah. So there is no obstacle. It's all, um, it's all a possibility as a, an inquiry. I just received the book a few days ago, and I've got a lot on my plate, so unfortunately I've only had a chance to read about half of it so far, but I, I'm really enjoying it. Um, but so, so don't give away the punchline, but for the, <laughs> for the sake of uh, those who haven't even looked at it yet, um, well, if you feel like doing more of a synopsis of the book, great, but perhaps it'll just come out in the course of our conversation. Um, for instance, what, oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say, you started at the first, you know, it says a hidden treasure. Mm -hmm. This was a teaching story that my, my teacher often related, that 
under the floorboards of this woman's house was a huge treasure, and she had no idea about that. She was in great suffering because she thought she was in poverty. She thought she had nothing left, and and yet all the time she did. So it's not like all of a sudden she made something there. She just finally surrendered to the pointing of a stranger who said, just lift the floorboards mm-hmm. of your kitchen and discover what's there. And and that's really what I'm attempting to do in this book. I tell that story, and I also tell my story in part, and and deconstruct it in a way that, that the reader can discover how to tell and deconstruct their own stories, to lift the floor, floorboards, to to lift, to look under the foundation, uh, not as an analysis of the story, but to recognize what the themes are and to discover what's deeper, always mm-hmm. deeper. One thing that I started, the image that came to mind as I was reading your book and starting to think about this whole idea of stories as a pointer to the truth is that um, the Russian dolls, you know, where you have uh-huh. like egg shaped and you have a doll within a doll within mm-hmm. a doll within a doll. Right. And, um, you know, you can peel away a story and find there's a, a deeper story there, and then you peel away that one, and then there's another. And then you get to some uh, something that doesn't have maybe the uh, the linearness of a story. It's a, a feeling. Mm. Uh, we could call that an emotion or a sensation. It doesn't matter. It's a, an energy. Usually our story is our whether it's the inner sanctum story or the superficial story, it's an attempt to make sense of that or to control that or to escape that. Mm -hmm. And so then the invitation of inquiry is to actually open to that because that's that's actually the life force. That's consciousness discovering itself as being. Mm -hmm. And in that direct discovery, there is an abundance of joy. So practically speaking, though, a person hears hears us talking and hears you saying this, or even if they read your book, I mean, what actual concrete steps, uh, if any, can a person make to do this, to to you know relinquish the grip of their story, or to however you'd like to phrase it, um, so yeah. that it doesn't just become a sort of an intellectual idea. Well, that was interesting, yeah, stories, and then they just go on with their busy life and nothing comes of it. Well, yes, this this is my aim. I want to be as concrete as possible and as relevant to the daily life of, of anyone who reads this or is in any conversation with me at all. That's my that's my aim, because as I said earlier, we have enough teachings. We we understand enough. How does it relate? concretely in this life form. And so uh, you may know that in the book, at the end of several chapters, there are questions that really support the turning the attention back in to the story, first of all, to realize what is being told, but also under that, what what is fueling that? And it can either be some search for release from the story or a better story or keeping the good story that one has and and what's under that and in general as human beings as human animals there's fear underneath all of our attempts to get something or to fight something or to keep something away under all mind activity and that fear is linked to survival of the form and it's there's nothing wrong with that fear it's, it's just part of our animal nature. But as conscious human beings, we have the capacity to recognize that fear and for a moment to put aside the story that will save us from that fear, save us from death, really, or override that story with our consciousness and actually meet, meet fear and under fear quite often, Rick, usually, finally. There is, uh, well, it's really the fear of non-existence. Mm. And there is a sense of non-existence and a sense of nothingness. And this gets translated emotionally to, in most systems as a kind of despair or nothingness or a deep abyss. So this is the 
point of being willing to actually open to that, to remain conscious and open to that. And in that, mysteriously, a conscious human being has the capacity to discover who it is, <laughs> who it truly is as consciousness, as life. For that moment of inquiry, survival is not at the forefront. And for most animals, of course, survival is always at the forefront. So this is a, a retreat into what is here, even when this survival is not being handled. And you know, if you are able to read that book or, or tune into this conversation, you already have a, a life of privilege. And there are many people who really have to be thinking about survival at all moments, food or shelter or dodging bullets or bombs. But if in this moment you don't have to, and you don't if you can hear this, there is the spaciousness to actually take consciousness of this life form to a deeper level to realize where we come from, what is the source, what is always here. And hopefully as more and more people do realize that, there will be fewer people in the world dodging bullets and bombs. You know, yes. It'll, there'll be a contagion of it. <laughs> yes. Well, it is contagious. And you it, know, yeah. I mean, I, I know the difference now in speaking to people uh, for, you know, 20 years. It's very different to speak to people now. There is a, a loosening and the, the willingness to actually allow it in and, and the adventure of it and... Yes, I, I'm not a prophet, so I don't know what the outcome will be, but I know that it's, it's a very good way to spend one's life. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> beats working in an office, I guess. It, it, it beats being miserable, I'll tell you <laughs> that, wherever you are. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you feel that fear is sort of the ultimate gatekeeper in, in everyone and that uh, inevitably just about anybody is going to encounter counter that thre uh, a threshold that they have to cross that is characterized by fear? Mm, yes, I do. I, yeah. I know that there are other emotions, but mm -hmm. it gets down to fear. And mm -hmm. it gets down to fear of death. <laughs> yeah. Because that is so ingrained. That's in ourselves. Mm -hmm. and, and generally we, when we get spiritual, we, we make it wrong <laughs> we, or we want to be loving. But it's not wrong. And we can, if we open to it, there can be fear. It just doesn't have to tyrannize us. Mm. We don't have to obey it. We don't have to deny it. We don't have to fight it. We can open to it. As Woody Allen put it, I'm not afraid to die. I just don't want to be there when it happens. <laughs> <laughs> He's great with death. <laughs> <laughs> There's a, there's a verse in the Upanishads, uh, I don't know the Sanskrit, but the English is, certainly all fear is born of duality. Mm. Yes. Mm. Yes. Because that's where survival is. There's me and there's other. Yeah. <laughs> and other is either an ally or a threat. <laughs> <Huh>. <clears throat> so did you yourself uh, go through a fairly um, intense fear phase uh, at a certain point, you know? Well, I had been aware of fear in different ways before I met Papaji and had been aware of a certain kind of dramatization that was a way of acting out fear, but not really meeting fear. Mm. And uh, there's a question that I asked Papaji that's actually on tape where I say to him, you know, here I am with you and by the Ganga and my life seems really good now and it did it was so sweet mm -hmm. and I was afraid of losing that uh. if I thought I was hearing him say you have to give up everything he was saying that and he laughed at me and it, it it's on the tape and he laughs and he said it's because you still see yourself as separate from that mm -hmm. and so as long as there is this fear nothing wrong with it being there, but as long as it's there, it's then the point of inquiry. Mm. So when I recognize that, I recognize I could stop 
dramatizing that, or I could stop running away from that, or I could stop obeying that, lockstepping obeying that, and simply be afraid. Let the fear be here. Feel the, the sensation of fear. And in being afraid without fighting, obeying it it's not separate from life force and it's actually not even fear then it's a great burst of energy it's shakti itself mm. i guess it's almost everybody does all sorts of things to distract themselves from that which is uncomfortable you know whether it's drugs or sex or alcohol or you know discos with flashing strobe lights or whatever you know people there there's a there's a sort of a tendency to do that and you know what you're saying is you know you just sort of turned it around 180 degrees and said all right let's just yes. sit, with, sit with this discomfort and see where it takes me that's right yeah. it, that to me really is what all meditation is finally about it's mm -hmm. Of course, uh, you, I'm sure you know more about meditation than I do, but it's they're different practices, and they all are training the mind to actually have the capacity to return to its source. It's the wild bull or whatever the metaphor it's used to actually come back in. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I, as you say, there are different types of meditation, but you know, f in my experience, it's... Um, it's almost like this sort of cat scan of, okay where is there something mm -hmm. where is there some discomfort where is there something mm -hmm. that needs some attending to you know and, yes and, and you know usually by the end of a sitting phew, it's dissipated yeah because <laughs> yes it's it's so beautiful it's an opportunity then it's not like oh this shouldn't be arising or right. oh this means i am not something something this is in that, it, you can even see it's your ancestral karma, you know, or the the humanness arising, and that you are you are willing to be consciousness itself, meeting uh, all human in your all your relations, meeting here. I came across an intriguing quote from Ramana Maharshi recently that I'd like to have you comment on. Um, you know, there are a lot of people in spiritual circles who say. Well, there are, there really are no levels of awareness because awareness is just one whole, you know. And to to refer to levels is to stratify it, you know. But Ramana's quote was, "Yes, there are no levels of awareness, but there are levels of experience." Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He's so good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, if you think about it, you and I and a cockroach are all sort of, you know, yes. basic, basically rooted in the same awareness, but but our experiences are different. Yes. And it seems to me the whole game is about, you know, shifting one's level of experience. Yes, and this is the the great benefit of a human developed, evolved mind. Nervous system and mind. Nervous yeah. system, yes. Exactly. So we actually have the capacity to reflect. And I know it seems like primates have capacity to reflect and probably whales and elephants and, and maybe many other species that we don't maybe even the cockroach I don't know but <laughs> well, we to know some degree, yeah. well we don't know but we know that humans have that and right. what a gift that we actually have the opportunity to turn the mind back to its source and and when I say in I, I don't exactly mean introspection although it begins as introspection but it, it is so deep that then it there's a a dissolution of inside and outside that we are looking in when we are looking at each other yeah we're looking out when we're discovering as you said like this cat scan of uh, bossner's or habits or residue or whatever and would you um concur with the thought that you know not only as human beings are we endowed with this marvelous capacity but to reflect but that you know we're not necessarily stuck with whatever capacity we are born with we can refine that capacity mm -hmm. and there appears to be no end to the refinement yes i think uh you know it can atrophy <laughs> yeah <laughs> worse and uh and really it's this willingness to be uncomfortable and chindo's willingness to to actually stop and and discover what is here, what's pulling on me, what, and my telling. So, what is the story that is a avoiding something that's here? Where are we not looking? That naturally strengthens the resilience and, the, or at least reveals 
more of a resilience and reveals more capacity, whether we define that as brain function or soul, it doesn't even really matter. It's uh, it's an experience of life lived fully and endlessly and and without a net. <laughs> yeah. and, and so there can be great discomfort in that. Uh, that is a part of life. It can be pain, but there's always the willingness to to discover more hmm. endlessness. I think it might have been Jean Klein who, who used the phrase free fall forever. Yeah, oh, he was beautiful. <laughs> I got to meet him once and ah, cool. we just cried together. He was so oh, tender. Wow. Just, mm. Yeah. The reason I bring up that point, I bring it up in almost every interview, is that you know, some people seem to say, and I can't dispute them. I mean, if somebody says, no, this is the way it is, I say, fine, mm -hmm. who am I to say it isn't? But um, I, my, the way I'm wired, it seems to me <laughs> that there is very probably no end to the refinement. I mean, you referred to John Klein just now. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, probably, I don't, you know, silly to compare yourself with others, but I would probably not be wrong to say that compared to Jean Klein's level of refinement, I'm kind of a clod. <laughs> and maybe I'll grow in that direction. I don't know. Um, but <sighs> All you can know is for your own self. Yeah. And you know that you have grown. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And continue to. That's right. And yeah. I, I heard this wonderful story from Jean Dunn, who was one of Nisargadatta's um, students and translators and she said at his death he was saying forget <laughs> I am that I've realized so much more since then it's so much ah. deeper and that is the really good news I mean we the good news is that this shift is possible and that this awakening is possible but the extraordinary thrilling good news is that it's endless Beautiful, yeah. yeah. It's almost like you get started at that point. Yes, that's the beginning. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So, so this, uh, so how would you say that, you know, over the last twenty years since your thunderclap moment, you know, and you had that major shift, oh, how would you characterize the growth or the refinement that has taken mm. place? Well, when you brought up the whole physicality, I realized that there, there's been a, a penetration in the density where I'm more dense physical but certainly there are emotional areas too and and a willingness for revelation and also people often ask me about integration and embodiment mm. it's really big in spiritual circles right now and it seems to me that that happens quite naturally and that part of the embodiment is like a, a resolution of the paradox of ordinary and extraordinary oh. Beautiful, <laughs> love that. <laughs> yeah, it's what, one of my favorite words is paradox. But mm. yes, uh, yeah. <laughs> me too. That's beautiful, and and I suppose you could also throw the word integration in there because it's sort of like the extraordinary is being integrated into the or ordinary. And, That's right. You know. Yes. Yeah. And they've never really been separate. No. But in our minds, the the barriers that we have constructed since we've been constructing so 10,000 years, whatever that's been just get more and more porous, more and more obviously insubstantial yeah, huh, beautiful um, now you and Eli are very frank about the various mm. travails that you go through as a couple and uh, in fact you use really that as a, a teaching point, a teaching example um, and I think that's very healthy because it's honest and also mm -hmm. because um, everybody goes through these things and so people can say well if they're going through it then uh, maybe <laughs> I'm not such a yeah. schmuck after all <laughs> yeah um, that's right and um, do you I'm curious you know I mean no one wants to go through things like that you, you don't you don't sort of try to <laughs> but 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 they happen <laughs> and but when you look back in retrospect do you feel like ah you know all is well and wisely put and that was actually a process of growth that was I'm I'm blessed to have gone through it well I would say it was a, a process of growth that was forced because <laughs> of circumstances and because choices it, it, and yeah because there was some blindness there there, yeah. there, there was something that was not being seen and it mm. and so it and, and since the commitment here is to see everything to experience yeah. more fully that is an invitation 
for whatever is not seen to make itself seen. And so I wouldn't say that events had to happen the way they happened, but they did happen that way. And, and that's true for all of us, whether it's internal events or external events. Then the question is, what is our relationship to them? Mm. And that's where, that's where we can uh, use it all. It's all, it's all here. So. Yeah, and, and if we can see the universe as divinely orchestrated, then we can sort of see events as they confront us as, you know, blessings or lessons, yes. p- potential lessons for us. Well, certainly we can see our reactions to events as revealing where we are still fighting something or where we are avoiding something or where we're trying to grasp something. Mm-hmm. And in that we have the, the invitation to open always more deeply. So in terms of your own reactions, I mean, when you think of sort of the worst of the worst of, of things you've been through mm-hmm. um, since your awakening, mm-hmm. um, in those darkest moments, if we want to use that adjective, um, did you feel overshadowed or lost? Did you feel that you lost your awakening or was there always sort of some foundation despite the, the, the chaos that was, you, know, you were going through? There was never a lack of love and there was never an absence of stillness, even though emotions got very strong, <laughs> voices got very loud. It, I, I experienced a lot of anger and, and a lot of deep sadness, but always I was not separate from myself. And that's why I can say from that moment of that revelation uh, that we started the conversation with at Eslin, and then over the 20 years of somehow the mysterious, effortless integration of that, that this was a a very important aspect of that because it actually stirred up really deep um, resentments from the past, and not just in my relationship, but relationships, mm-hmm. <laughs> beginning with my parents or the world or whatever. And, and in that, they could have their play because they weren't separate from this silent, aware love. So I I am this human being and I am this consciousness and they are not separate. And that was revealed more deeply. So no matter how angry you were or no matter how hurt you felt, the love was counterbalanced that. The love was was there without, it it wasn't um, shaken by, by those I wasn't necessarily feeling love the way uh-huh. we think of a feeling of love. I was uh-huh. feeling anger right. <laughs> or feeling sadness, but I wasn't searching for love because mm. I didn't need anything to be different because mm. the fulfillment didn't need a feeling of fulfillment mm. for its reference point. That's interesting do you do you also feel that that's a an advantage for a relationship in general i mean if if your fulfillment is primarily derived from something that does not depend upon what the other person is doing then the relationship doesn't have to be sort of in gimme mode you know it it can sort of be independent of the the waves of you know sometimes it's better sometimes it's worse absolutely well you it can at least be clear because relationship means that you're usually relating to somebody, whether you're living with them or not. And so that means that there are certain certain agreements that have to be reached. And, you know, I mean, it's not like you are just in the cave relating with yourself. And, and yet, if, if you are trying to idealize what that person should give you, as you were just mentioning, there's no way there can be clarity there. When you have realized you are already that, you can still have some issues of relationship, but they're not the issues of your your identity, of your fulfillment. Hmm. I was on a monastic program in the TM movement for many years, and you know you could become very idiosyncratic there because you didn't have to sort of be <laughs> face to face with one person if if somebody got on your on your nerves you could just sort of gravitate off in some other direction yeah. uh but boy when i got married which was quite an abrupt transition mm-hmm. from being there to to being married it, it was quite challenging the the adjustments mm-hmm. that had to be undergone and it's humbling <laughs> yeah very yeah. much so and and we have to be humbled mm-hmm. the mind has to 
And yeah. it is. Life, life takes care of that. Huh. Thank God. Yes. Huh. Well, I know that you you talk a lot um, in the course of your life, and it, it does take a toll on the voice, so I don't want to keep it. It is, yeah. It's winding yeah. down. I can feel that. <laughs> yeah, and so I don't want to <laughs> overdo it, you know. Um, so maybe we should wrap it up. This has been really delightful. Um, mm -hmm. Is there anything you'd like to say in conclusion, anything that you generally do like to say that we haven't thought to bring up or anything like that? You know, I, I often speak, how Papaji told me, stop, and how important that is. And really what I feel I'm here to say to people is that you can trust yourself. And when I say yourself, I'm not speaking of your thoughts, which aren't trustworthy, or your emotions, which aren't trustworthy, and they are also aren't the problem. That yourself, the truth of who you are, this, from the initial arising of this either recognition or desire for a bigger life, or free life, and uh, enlightened life, however it's defined, this is trustworthy. This is your own self calling you home. So when you say you can trust yourself, you mean that you can trust that impulse. If you if you feel a pull toward this, honor it. Yeah. This is, yes, honor this, listen to this. Yeah. It, it, put your full attention on this, and, and it delivers everything that's necessary. Seek and you shall find. Mm. <laughs> Very good. Mm. Well, thank you, Gangaji. Um, oh, thank you, Rick. This has been really fun. Yeah, me, for me too, very much. Um, so let me just make a couple of concluding points. Um, I've been speaking with Gangaji, who is a much beloved and well-known teacher. Um, and I will be, if you haven't heard of her, you must have been living under a rock, but uh, <laughs> I will put uh, her a link to her website on mine when I post this interview. And you can go there and find out about courses she teaches and, you know, retreats and seminars and, and um, books and whatnot. Um, also, you'll find that my site, which is batgap.com, uh, all the other interviews I've done and will yet do, and if you sign up for the email newsletter thing, you'll get an email about once a week when I post a new interview notifying you that I've done so. There's also a, a podcast if you like to listen to this while you're commuting. Um, and there's a little discussion group that pops up around every <laughs> single interview where people can go in and start chatting about what was discussed. So you're welcome to participate in that if you like. So thank you, everyone, f for mm. listening or watching. Thank you, Gangaji. Mm. <laughs> And we'll see you next mm -hmm. week.